Amen. So keep your place in Matthew chapter 23. That's going to be our um, kind of our core um, scripture for this evening. We're going to be coming back there um, throughout the sermon. Uh, Matthew chapter 23 is, uh, you know, it's kind of a, every, every word, if you have a red letter Bible, every word except the first verse is red because this is just Jesus uh, speaking. It's kind of, I guess you could, you could qualify it as an epic rant uh, from Jesus against um, the Pharisees. Um, but we're going to look back at this uh, as our core scripture um, tonight. So just bookmark that no matter where I take you. Bookmark Matthew 23 so you can always get back to Matthew chapter 23. Right now turn to Colossians chapter 3 if you would. So we're looking at um, off the rails. We're doing our second. Um, we're finishing up the series. I'm a, a two-part series tonight. Last week we talked about um, followers. We talked about you know, um, it doesn't matter if we're following a good leader or not. You know, the Bible commands us to be um, good followers if that is our role. Look at Colossians chapter 3 and look at verse number 22. Colossians chapter 3, look at verse number 22. The Bible says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. Saying, um, if, you, if you're in a servant position, you know, if you have a, a boss and you're the, you're the employee or you're in a position of um, having a leader over you, um, which everyone will um, at some point or at, in their life to some degree, um, you know, you're supposed to um, obey your masters according to um, the flesh, not just with eye service, not just, you know, not just on the outside. You're supposed to actually just do what they um, say with signals of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not unto men. You're not supposed to be like, well, this guy's not a good leader. He's not a good boss, so I'm just going to give him half effort. I'm just going to give him a half, you know, uh, half willingness to, to serve. Look at verse 24. How, how could you do that, though? I mean, how could you work for a boss or serve a leader that wasn't good? We talked about this last week. Knowing that the Lord, that of the Lord, he shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. So that's how you do it. You serve you know, your masters, you serve your leaders in your life like you're serving Christ. That's the answer, all right? That's how you can work for and serve a leader, whether it be a wife um, to her husband, whether it be an employee to a boss, whether it be any kind of um, position where you are in servitude or you are in the service position um, and someone is a leader over the top of you, um, just serve like you're serving Christ. That's how you're supposed to do it. Tonight, though, we're looking at the opposite side of this coin. As we talked about how to be a good servant, how to be in submission, how to be um, following a master or a leader, even when they're not leading properly, tonight we're going to talk about you know, how to be a leader and when you're having trouble with people following you. So many people struggle with this in their lives you know, because, look, again, we're all leaders and we're all, except for the smallest child in this room, we're all leaders and we're all followers. So... Even, you know, children, even, you know, wives are going to be leaders to their children in their home. So how do you go about, you know, leading people when, you know, maybe they don't want to follow? You know, how do you go about, you know, getting people on board? I mean, with parents, you know, with parents, dads and, and moms, you know, it's easy starting out in life. It's easy to get, you know, kids on board because it's like, look, you know, you just do what I say or you get spanked. That's what the Bible says. But... You know, this actually applies also to parents that maybe, you know, go through a life change. Maybe they get saved later in life and they have older children. I've seen this several times in my life. You know, the parents um, get saved, they hear the gospel, and they want to take their family, or they want to turn the ship of their family when their kids are maybe a little bit older. Maybe they're in their teens at this point. Now you need to maybe do some, you know, leadership to get everybody on board with this change of direction in the family. Look, it's a, it's a worthy change of direction, but even parents could struggle with this to some degree. But look, the principles that we're going to talk about tonight, it applies to all leadership. It applies to wives, parents, it applies to husbands leading their families, it applies to me leading this church. It applies across the board. It applies to a boss at work. All these things that the Bible talks about, that the Bible teaches us, is, you know, is going to apply to any position of leadership, okay? So leadership is influence, is, is what leadership is. Leadership is the ability to, look, it's one thing if you're in the position of leadership, but leadership is actually the ability to be able to influence people. That's what it should be. So if you're in that position, you should be able to, and look, God ordains leadership in certain places, 
in the family, in the church, you know, in government even. God ordains, you know, leadership. God doesn't just want chaos. God doesn't just want everybody in charge, everybody doing whatever they want. That's, that's nothing to do with anything in the Bible, if you're reading the Bible, all right? But look, you should, in a leadership position, you should be able to influence people to follow you. Another leadership position the Bible talks about, we talked about last week, is ladies in the church. Ladies, you know, the married women, you know, leadership um, over the younger single women, you know, all of these things. But look, here's the thing, folks. Being in charge isn't like a magical switch that goes off. It's not like I'm in charge, suddenly everyone's just going to do whatever I say, no matter what. Because here's the thing. As we talked about the last couple of weeks, people don't always do the right thing. People don't always, you know, follow how they should. People don't always lead how they should, which is the point of this series. So tonight, I'm just going to give you three simple philosophies from the Bible on how to lead effectively and how to get people to follow your influence as a leader. Go back to Matthew chapter 23. Like I said, Matthew chapter 23 is basically Jesus giving a rant against the Pharisees. He's kind of giving, he's, he's talking to them as like the anti-leader. He's looking, he's talking to the Pharisee as, you know, here's how you don't lead. Here's how you, he's just basically telling them everything they're doing wrong. So if we go through and we look at especially some of the main things that Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, we can learn a lot about how we can do this right as leaders. So the first point I want to make is down in verse number three. Let's look at verse number three of Matthew chapter 23, where the Bible says, well, I'll just start in verse two, where Jesus starts talking. He says, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So what he's saying here is he's saying the scribes and the Pharisees are in this leadership position. That's what Moses was. He was the spiritual leader. He was the governmental leader. He was the leader of the children of Israel. Look at verse number three. So he's saying now, instead of Moses, in this role you have these Pharisees and these scribes. Look at verse 3. He says, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. So notice what he says here. The first point I want to make, as far as leadership principles from the Bible, is if you want to be an effective leader, you need to be present. So what does that mean? What does that mean? There's this word that Jesus uses over and over and over in Matthew chapter 23. And he explains what the word means in verse number 3, where he says, he says they tell you to do all these things, but, he, but Jesus says, but just don't do what they do. So the point I'm trying to make in point number 1 here is that in order to be an effective leader, you need to be present. And this word that Jesus uses over and over and over again, I think half a dozen or more times in Matthew 23, is this word hypocrite. He uses the word hypocrite. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite is something that Jesus points out in verse number three that the Pharisees are. A hypocrite is a leader that says, do this, and then they do the opposite thing. Or they don't do that. Or, you know, or they say, you do this, and then I do nothing at all. That would be a hypocrite. I could either tell you, hey, you need to do these things, if, you know, you want to be successful and then I don't do any of those things, or even worse, I could go do the opposite of those things. And that's what Jesus was saying that the Pharisees were doing in verse number three. He's saying, hey, they're telling you to do all these things. And Jesus is saying, that's good. But then he says, but just don't watch what they're doing because they're doing the opposite of these things. So look, you must, as, as a leader, an effective leader, you must be a real example is the point that Jesus is trying to make. Being an absentee leader never works. I don't care what leadership you're in, if it's secular, spiritual, whatever. Being a leader that just tells people to do things and then doesn't do those things himself is, is, is never going to work. It never has. All right? You must show the way is what Jesus is trying to explain here. He's He's kind of giving you the leadership principles by telling them what they're doing wrong in Matthew chapter 23. So you must show the way. You say, in, in what way? In what way? Here's the thing. In every way. <laughs> in every way, in every way that you want to have influence, you must show the way, is what Jesus is saying. What are you trying to influence, parents? You're like everything. 
What are you trying to influence in your family? Fathers? What are you trying to influence husbands? You must show that way. You must do those things. Turn to look at Matthew chapter 23 and look at verse number 27. You see, you can appear, you can appear perfect to people. This is where the family leadership really, you know, th this will really get the husbands here. This will really get the fathers here. Because the family leadership, you can appear pretty good to people outside your family. It's not that hard. Because quite frankly, people don't know you that well. People don't see what's going on inside your home. You're not inside my home. I'm not inside your home. I don't want to be inside your home. I don't want you inside my home. But the point is, is that in order to lead, who, who am I leading though? As, as a father and as a husband, who am I leading? I am leading the people inside my home. So I must appear real and genuine and non-hypocritical to the people inside my home, the people I'm trying to influence. Look at Matthew chapter 23, look at verse 27. Look what Jesus says here. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead man's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also appear righteous, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of, full of hypocrisy and iniquity. He's saying, you guys look pretty good on the outside, but you're all, you're all rotten is what he's saying. He's like, you look pretty good to these people out here. You got all the right garments. You know, you got all the right, you know, dress. You, all, you look pretty spiritual to the people out here. He's like, but I see who you are. Jesus is saying, I see who you are. Why? He's God. But guess what? The people in our homes, they see who we are. They see our wives, our children. They see who we are. You know, women leading children. Look, your children see who you are. You know, I mean, look at this sermon from this morning. Uh, a, a wife is not going to be able to teach her, her kids to, you know, do real things and learn real things if she's constantly, and, and to stay out of their, their screens and stay off of these phones if she's constantly on her phone and constantly in the screens herself. It's, it's hypocritical. So the people that we're trying to lead need to see that we are real in all of these things. Because guess what? They know who you are. They know who you are. You can't expect people, you know, even outside your home and leadership positions, you couldn't be a boss at some company and expect people that worked for you to just, you know, just, you want to influence hard work. I want to influence hard work with my employees and then I show up late and I leave early. It's just, it's not going to work. You have to be present and be real and be a real example in the things that you're trying to to influence. I can't try to teach my kids the dangers of fornication and pornography and putting wicked things in front of my eyes and really, you know, get that across to them and tell them, you know, hey, you know, get your act together. Don't do these things. Stay away from all these things that the world is telling you when they see me into all that stuff. I, it, would, it would just, here's the thing, it just would never work. It would never work. This is what Jesus is saying. This is what Jesus is saying here. I couldn't tell my wife and my daughter, hey, I want you to dress like a lady. Because the Bible says that ladies should be dressed like ladies and men should be dressed like men. You think that's a problem today? How could I do that? How could I say, you know what? I want my daughter and my wife and I want to, this is something I want to lead and influence them in. I want them to cover up their nakedness according to what the Bible says, not according to what the world says today. I want them to dress modestly. I want them to have respect for themselves. I want my daughter to be a virtuous young lady. And then I go to places I would never allow them to go. And then I go to places that, you know, where women are just, I just know women are going to be dressed horribly. Here's the thing, it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. Why? Because I'd be a hypocrite, that's why. I'd be just what Jesus is talking about here. This is why I don't, you know, we, we avoid places where we know that people are going to be dressed inappropriately. We, we don't go to beaches on a hot, we don't go to hot climate beaches. Because why would I want my, why would I do that to either myself and also to, to my, my wife and daughter? 
I'd be making myself a hypocrite. Is what I'd be. I don't even go to. I don't go to gyms. I would never join a gym, for this same reason. Because I know what people are, are dressed like there. And I would never. If I my kind of my theory is, if I wouldn't be comfortable walking in there with my wife, I, I don't go to these places. I draw those lines at that point because it's important for what I put in front of. My, it's important to not only what I put in front of my eyes, but also to not be a hypocrite in leadership is really what we're pointing at here. So look, it's the message that you're sending. How about spirituality? How, how could I teach my children to read the Bible? How could I teach my children, you know, how important it is to go to church and have Bible reading time and have prayer time if they never saw me reading the Bible? Or if they never saw me coming to church? If they never saw me doing these things? It would be a joke. I wouldn't be able to influence in that area. You say, well, they should listen to you. Yeah, they should, no matter what, but it just doesn't work that way. It just doesn't work. It should. Don't sit here as a follower and say, oh, you know, if, as long as, you know, I don't have a perfect leader. No, that's, that was a sermon last week. The point I'm trying to get you to understand is you must be consistent. You must be consistently present and be a consistent, real example in every area you are trying to influence as a leader. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Here's a good, here's a good, um, we're going to look at the qualifications of a pastor. And you're like, that's just for you. But here's the thing, this is a good guideline for anyone who wants to lead, right here. You say, what kind of things? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Let's look at the qualifications of a pastor. You say, what kind of things do I need to be consistent in to be a good spiritual leader? Well, you're kind of, especially the men in this room, you're pretty much the pastor of your home. You're the pastor of your wife. You're the pastor of your children. You know, when it comes down to that detail, you know, I'm not following you around at your house. You know, you are the spiritual leader of your family. So the Bible gives some qualifications for a pastor. Look, a pastor is not to be perfect. A pastor is not to be someone who's never made a mistake or anything like that. But there is qualifications for someone that wants to be a pastor. And this is a good guideline for any spiritual leader right here. Look at this. This is a true saying. If any man desire the office of a bishop, Pastor, elder, same thing. He desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. How are you going to teach your kids that alcohol is bad when you're a drunk? I mean, think about this. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense. I mean, this is some pretty basic stuff right here. Look at verse number four. Not greedy of filthy lucre, finishing up verse number uh, three. How are you going to teach your kids that, hey, you need to work hard and you need to make money, but don't start loving money when you love money? How are you going to teach your kids that? How are you going to teach that if you don't do it yourself? Look at verse number four. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of of the church of God. Meaning, if we're going to apply that to you, you should have good rule of your house, which is why we're talking about these types of things tonight. Saying that if, I, my, if, my, if my family was just a train wreck, like who would come to this church? <laughs> I mean, think about that. Who would come to the church? That's one of the, 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 one of the first things, and maybe this is just me, but when, when I met Pastor Jimenez, and I met his family, and I met his kids, it's one of the first things that I noticed about him. And one of the, you know, it's one of the things I'm always kind of looking for. Because if a man know not how to rule his own house, you know, how's he going to rule the church of God? So that's a super important thing to remember about a pastor. But look, it's saying how important it is here when applying it to yourself, how important it is to rule your own house well. All right? Having your children in subjection. So look, be real. Be genuine. You can't be just talk. And I've said this before. I'll say it again. Kids are hypocrite detectors when they're like four. They can tell. I mean, it's something that God's given them. I don't know. God's given them this little hypocrite alarm, this little thing that flashes. Like when you're a hypocrite, they're like, nee, nee, Dad, but you did this. They're going to they're gonna get you. And look, it's, it's, it's simple and it's silly when they're young, but it gets very serious when they get older. Because the corrections that you can make with your kids ladies and gentlemen tonight, they get smaller as they get older. So you can make big corrections with your kids. You're like, no, we're going this way. No, we're going this way. No, we're going this way when they're young. And you don't even have to explain it to them. It's a mistake parents make. They're like, they're trying to, you know, reason with a two-year-old. No, 
You do this or you get a spanking. That's it. That's how you reason with a two-year-old. Just do what dad says. Just do what mom says. But those corrections, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. So by the time they get to be a, a young adult, you better have them pointed in the general right direction. You're going to have some problems. So look, be real, be genuine, and you have to be present and not just talk. That's the first one. Go back to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. Look at verse 15. Matthew chapter 23, look at verse number 15. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is just dressing down. Now, how many people think that Jesus, when he was saying this, was just like, you uh, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. How many people think that that was his tone of voice here? As he's calling them serpents and vipers. I mean, he's sitting, I mean, he is, he is going after these people and he is telling it how it is right here. So the second point is this. The first one is be present. Don't be a hypocrite. Be a real, genuine example. The second point is this. Be correct. Be correct. What do I mean by that? Look at verse 15. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte, and when he is made, you make him twofold, twofold more out of hell than yourselves. You know what he's saying here? He's like, you go out and you get all these people to follow you, and then you teach them things that are wrong. He's like, you're teaching all these people false doctrine. You're not even teaching them the truth, is what Jesus is saying. So make sure, this is the second point, be correct. As a leader, you need to make sure that your decisions and your leadership is in line with the Bible. Because the Bible is your authority. As a parent, the Bible is your authority. As a husband, the Bible is your authority. As a father, the Bible is your authority. Because look, otherwise, I mean, what's the point? Where's your authority? This is the problem today. We saw a billboard yesterday. We saw a billboard yesterday. The kids pointed it out, and it said it had like a guy, and then where his head was supposed to be, it had like a, a coffee cup, and it, you know, like a plastic coffee cup or something, or a cardboard coffee cup, and it said, don't be a litter head. And I was just like, yeah, like it's the guy, like it's the guy getting a $5 coffee at Starbucks that's, that's the trash problem in California. That's, that's just a side note. But I said, to the, I said to the kids, I said, it should have said, don't be a heroin addict. That's what it should have said. But here's the point. Here, here's the point I'm trying to make here. What's the billboard? It's a nothing burger because there's no authority there. It's just some billboard. It's just some billboard. It just, it's just something that's just written. And there's absolutely no authority behind it. But the Bible is our authority. That's why when we go out soul winning, we don't go up to somebody and say, hey, let me um, tell you the gospel and tell you what the Bible says. And I'll just tell you what it says. No, we actually have the Bible and we actually show the Bible to people. Because why? Because my word has no power. Because my word is just my word. My opinion, I mean, look, I give some opinions every now and then from the public, but really, if it's not based in the Bible, my opinion doesn't mean much. The Bible is our authority, which is why we take it out soul winning. Otherwise, it's just my words. That's why we turn, that's why you're all sitting here flipping your Bible so much through sermons. Because why? Because I want this sermon to have authority. I want it to mean something, meaning it must come from the Bible. That's why. That's why we do this. You need to back up your leadership with the Bible. This is the second point. Here's why we go to church in this family, folks. The Bible. You know, here's what the Bible says about fornication. Here's how, here's how serious fornication is in the Bible. This is how your leadership needs to go. Here's why we don't go to these places. Bible. Here's why we do these things and other people don't do these things. The Bible. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. That's, that's our authority as spiritual leaders. Use it. Here's why I run the finances in my family the way I run the finances. The Bible. This is our authority. This is why I make the decisions the way we do in this family. You know, this is why I say, no, we won't go there. Because, why? Because of the Bible. Not just because like, I'm a jerk and don't want to do fun things or whatever. Many times, many or sometimes, 
Sometimes there's a situation where I can see that, you know, I, maybe my wife doesn't see the direction that, that I'm going in or, or whatever, and why I'm making certain decisions in the family. And look, I'll sit down and I'll explain to her the leadership perspective. It's not that she doesn't know the Bible or it's not that she doesn't know what's going on. It's just that leadership, the leadership position is a different viewpoint. It's a different viewpoint. So many times I'll just sit down and say, here's the whole picture that I'm looking at and here's why I'm taking us this way. And then look, it's just a different vantage point from the leader's seat. And it's a bigger picture. Really, and look, here's the thing. You will, as a leader, you will make decisions that not everyone will understand. That's another thing that you need to realize. But again, the authority needs to be the Bible. The authority does not need to be, here's where the authority does need to be, not wanting to hurt somebody's feelings. Or, you know, just emotionalism. Because many leaders, they just, they want to make everyone happy. And I don't want to make somebody sad. So I'm just going to do it this way. No, our authority as leaders always should come from the Bible. That's what I mean by be correct. Okay, because look, if not, if not, if I'm not using the authority of the Bible, and I'm just going along with whatever people that are underneath my leadership want to do, you know what, that's not leadership. <laughs> that's, that's not leadership. That's actually following is what that is. Look, if you're not saying no, and you're not doing things that are like, you should say no to your kids on a daily basis. If you're not saying no, and you are not, you know, sometimes at least going in a direction that not everyone necessarily agrees with, you're not leading. You know, I mean, just as a personal example, turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Um, just as a personal example of, you know, just leading a church. You know, this is a, this is a pastor-led church. Okay, this isn't a, a church on, you know, this isn't a democracy. This isn't a, like, lead-by-committee thing here. And I'm going to explain to you why that is. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Look, suggestions are, are fine. I mean, I mean, ideas are great. I mean, uh, Brother Jeff, a couple weeks ago, was like, hey, I think people are walking by the front door, and they're not seeing where the door entrance of the church is. It would be great if we had a sign. Bam! Great idea. Made a sign. See, these are the types of things. But look, leading the church means that many times I'm going to have to say no to things. And I've said no to many, many, many things in this church. But guess what? You might say, well, isn't it easier to say yes? Isn't it easier to say yes to people? And, and to that, I'm just like, that, I, I reject the question. Because it doesn't matter if it's easier to say yes or I don't want to, you know, upset somebody. It's just like we're just going to do things the Bible way. That's it. You say, why? Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Because I'm in a different position than you. I'm in a different vantage point. And look, there's different rules for me, actually, than you. Look at verse number 17. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, it says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls... As you must give account? No, it says as they must give account. This is saying, look, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Look, I point that verse at myself, and I take that very seriously, that I'm going to have to one day give account to God how Christ's church was run on this earth. And I want to do that with joy, not like, uh, well, God, you know, I just didn't want to upset those people down there. Look, this happens to churches all the time. This, this is how churches go liberal. This is how churches get rid of the King James Bible. This is how churches get rid of the Bible. Is that the people start leading the pastor. You know how many times I've had to say no to people in this church? Not, not you people, but just people. You know what I mean? Here's a, here's a common one. A common one. People want to start a ch children's ministry here. It's happened, I mean, many times. People have come here and want to, they want to start a children's ministry. It's usually people that, that, you know, they don't come to the church much. You know, they're, they're usually men for some weird reason. And they want to start Sunday school or something where they're teaching children. And it's just like, oh, yeah, thank you. No! That is never going to happen here. 
ever. Why? Because the Bible, that's why. Because in Deuteronomy chapter 31, when Moses put up, it says he went and he got the men, he went and he got the women, and he got the children too. Same thing with Ezra in Ezra chapter 10. Everybody, and look, you can tell. You, nobody's been, if you came from another church, there was, it wasn't family integrated, and you came here, look at these kids. It's the Bible working. The Bible, the kids are supposed to listen to the preaching of the Word of God. And they sit here and they listen. We see these kids grow up. And all of a sudden when they're five years old, they're six years old, they start asking about the gospel. They start asking questions. How do I get to heaven? What about this Jesus thing? They come out soul winning. They're like, hey, I, I want to believe on Jesus. I want to trust in Jesus. And now, that's how you end up getting six and seven-year-old kids saved. That's how kids get saved at such a young age because they've been in a family integrated church hearing the preaching of the word of God since they were two, three, four years old. That's how. That's why when you go out soul winning, you come up to some child that's not churched, that hasn't been sitting in church listening to the Bible, it's going to be tough for a nine or ten year old to understand. You know, I won't even really give the gospel to an eight year old that, or maybe even a nine year old, it's, it's, it's really that gray area that hasn't been in church before. But they're in church and they, it, it just, it just because they've been hearing the word of God. It's been working on their heart. It's, it's why God had it that way. When these great priests and these great leaders stood up, the children were there. You show me Sunday school in the Bible and we'll start one. You won't find it. So here's the first, the first thing is don't be a hypocrite. Be a real example. If you want to be a, an effective leader that people will follow, be a real example. The second one, where does your authority come from? Your authority comes from the Bible. Use it. Use the Bible. It's your authority. Lead according to the Bible. Because guess what? If you're going to lead in a different direction, the Bible actually gives that out to followers. It says, no, no, no. Children don't have to obey their parents if it's not in the Lord. You know, same thing with the wife, same thing with, you know, all leaders, same thing with government leaders. We always have to obey the highest power, which is God, the higher powers. All right? Here's the third one. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And I'll read for you in Matthew chapter 23, verse number 11. You're going to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. But the third one is this. And Jesus, Jesus even mentions it in Matthew chapter 23, in verse number 11, where he says, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Here's the third one. To be an effective leader, you need to be selfless. You need to, you're like, oh, man, I don't want the job anymore. <laughs> you're like, I thought I was going to be the boss. And it was just like, you're going to do what I say. But it says, be selfless. Jesus says this in chapter, in chapter 23, verse 11. He basically says, he who is greatest among you. He's like, the leaders should be the servants, is what Jesus said. And look, he, he lived his life that way on this earth. He washed the disciples' feet. He was... He said, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. It literally defines this in Ephesians chapter 5 for us in the marriage. Look at Ephesians 5 verse 25. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. All right, what does that mean? I, of course I love my wife. I'll go buy her flowers right now. Look at what the Bible says, though. It defines this for us. It says, husbands, love your wives, even as, like it's saying, in the same way. As Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Saying, say, like, it's defining love for us here. This is a problem today. Love is not lust, okay? Love is not some butterfly feeling I get in my stomach. Love is not, oh, you know, I saw some girl and, you know, I think I love her. No, that's lust. That's lust. Love is sacrifice, is what the Bible is saying here. You love your wife like Christ loved the church. What did he do? He died. He died. Look, women are not required to do this for their husbands. This is a one-way street right here. Look at verse 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men, meaning say in the same way. There's, he's giving this beautiful comparison of what Christ did for the church, for us, for people, so ought to men love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Saying, like, if you won't sacrifice for your wife, if you say you love your wife, but you do no action or give no sacrifice that shows you love her, it's like you don't even love yourself. 
It's like that's, that's not the way to do it. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Go back to Matthew chapter 23. Go back to Matthew 23. So true biblical leadership should be selfless. A parent should be sacrificing for their children. A husband should be willing, I mean, literally, in, in Ephesians chapter 5, it says literally, a husband should be willing to lay down his life for his wife. That's what the Bible is saying here. Look at Matthew chapter 23. Look at verse number 13. Matthew 23, verse 13. He says, But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men, for neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. I, just, I love that verse right there. He's like, you're going to go to hell. And he's like, and then you're going to just not allow anybody else to hear the truth either. But look at verse number 14. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayer, therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. So first of all, I mean, this puts aside, I mean, let me just side note this thing right now, the greater damnation, meaning somebody that is a false prophet teaching false things, keeping somebody from being saved is much worse and committing a much worse sin. And not only are they committing a, this is, this, this just shuts down all sin is equal garbage. That is not in the Bible. Is all sin is equal. Somebody's telling you all sin is equal. That's an evil, wicked person right there. The Bible is saying that these people are doing something. These Pharisees, these teachers are doing something to where they're literally going to receive a greater damnation. What does that mean? It means they're going to burn in a lower part of hell. They're going to have a greater suffering. They're going to have greater punishment. Look, hell is hell. We don't want to go there. Nobody wants to go to hell. But these people are going to go to, it's going to be worse for them, is what Jesus is saying. Saying their sin is worse. Their punishment is going to be worse. Showing the, I mean, showing the justice of God. Showing the justice of God. I mean, it, would it, does it really even seem fair to your conscience that somebody who just, you know, didn't believe the gospel was, but tried to just live a decent life, but they weren't saved, look, they're going to hell, is going to go and get the same punishment as Joseph Stalin who killed tens of millions of people? Probably not. But that's not what the Bible teaches, right? That's what liberal, weird Christianity teaches today, all right? So that, all that to say this. We're talking about... You know, we're talking about uh, these people, instead of having a selfless leadership, what were they doing? They were devouring widows' houses. They were the anti-leaders, according to this last point. They were taking advantage of people. They were, they were get, the people that they were supposed to be serving, they were taking advantage and taking their money and and. and making those people their servants, basically. They were doing it the opposite way, taking advantage of them. To the Pharisees, what Jesus was pointing out is, you know what, this is all about you. This is all about you. Your leadership is all about you looking good. It's all about you getting money. It's all about you doing these things. He's like, in the meantime, you're sending all these people to hell. He's like, you're going to be punished greater for it, is what Jesus is saying. So look, those are the three things. Those are the three biblical philosophies that you should follow. You know, you should be a selfless leader. You should use the Bible as your authority, and you should not be a hypocrite. See, leadership is not this. People think it's just this magic button that, you know, bang, I'm in charge now. Everything can be my way. That's not the way it is. And guess what? Followers should follow, as we talked about last week. But look, how you lead will make it easier for them to follow you. It will make it, if you're a parent, if you're a husband, if you're a master at work, you're a leader tonight. You might as well be good at it. You know, you might as well be good at it. There's very few. As a matter of fact, when I think about a 23-year career that I've had, and I just think about secular leaders, I can think of one or two, one in particular, that was really a truly good leader. I mean, the man was just a good leader, but, you know, he fits all these principles. He fits all these biblical principles. He was easy to follow. He was easy to follow because he fits these principles. Following him, you just knew you would succeed. You just knew that you would succeed because, you know, he was the real deal. He had a great plan, and he would be there as the plan was executed. He would be walking right with you. And if things went wrong, he was there. You knew he had your back. You could trust him. 
You know, I mean, being, if you're going to be in a leadership position, which you are, if you're a man tonight, you're the leader of your wife. If you're a man tonight, you're the leader of your children. If you're a wife tonight, you're a leader of your children. You know, I mean, you might as well be good at it. You might as well be good at it. I mean, this morning, you know, we talked about, you know, there will be failure of, of those that, you know, we lead. There will be failure and successes in our lives. There will be failures and successes in our lives. As a leader, you share in the failure of people you lead. But the, the other side of that coin is you share in the successes of the people that you lead. You know, you might as well make it a success. Why not follow the Bible and be good at it? Use the authority of the Bible. You know, and then live your leadership. Be present there to lead. And look, look at verse number... Um, I, I don't remember where the verse is, but he said, Jesus says it. He's like basically saying, don't ask people, don't ask people. He binds heavy, they, verse 4, they bind heavy burdens. This is, you know, not being a hypocrite. Don't bind burdens on people that you yourself wouldn't be willing to bear, is what Jesus says. This is what a, a good leader would never do this. A good leader would never ask people to do things that they weren't willing to do. That's why you need to be present. You need to be there and show that you are willing to bind those same burdens. And then, you know what? Be a sacrificial leader. Because guess what? Even somebody brought it up this morning, you know, uh, after we were visiting after church, somebody said, yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard to be a pastor. Somebody said that. But here's the thing. Yeah, you're right. It's easier. It's easier to not be a leader. It's easier to be a church member in the context of the church. Think about this. In the context of the church, it is definitely easier to be a church member than it is to be the pastor, for sure. Okay, but what's the point of that? What's the point of even thinking about that? Because guess what? You think about your family, you think about a husband leading a wife, a husband leading a family, somebody's got to lead. Somebody's got to lead. It's not a matter of it's, it's easier to be the pastor or easier to be the church member. It's somebody has to be the leader. That's what it's all about. You know what I mean? Dads, dads and moms, we have, we have an absolute responsibility to pass, think about the sermon this morning, to pass the information, the knowledge, the skills that we have onto the next generation. But guess what? It's easier to not to. It's easier, it's easier not to. I go out and I work on some project somewhere, in my yard or wherever, it's easier to go out there and work on it myself than to have a, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, or a nine-year-old with me teaching them how to do all the things. It's much easier to just, just knock it out myself. But we have an absolute responsibility to lead in these areas. We have an absolute responsibility to pass this on to the next generation. I saw a t-shirt, my wife showed me a t-shirt the other day that said, it just made me laugh. It said, uh, what did it say? It said, I can, and it said, nothing offends me. I used to hold the flashlight for my dad. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, like immediately I started having flashbacks. You know, underneath a tractor in the middle of the night, you know, trying to get a wrench on some bolt that it's impossible to get the wrench on the bolt. How could they put it there? Trying to just sit there and trying to, look, you can't be a TikTok kid. You can't be a TikTok kid if you're trying to hold that flashlight, you know, and your dad's under there and it's, it's, 10 below zero and trying to get that wrench on there, just hold that flashlight on that bolt. I just remember there's like, don't move that light, don't move that light, don't move that light. And all of a sudden you're like, hey, why are you, hey? But look, it is absolutely our responsibility to teach these things to our kids. It's easier to go build it yourself. You know, you can have a headlight now. You don't have to have anybody hold the flashlight for you. It's easier to go get a screwdriver myself other than telling, you know, the nine-year-old to go get the screwdriver and he comes back with an adjustable wrench. Or you go back and you see him in a pile of tools on the garage floor and he's trying to figure out, you know, what is a, what is a crescent wrench. Then you got it's easier just to do it yourself and not have to go and teach that lesson again until they get it. We have an absolute responsibility to lead in every area. Not just these areas. You see, you start to see how, you say, well, I don't really have anything to teach my kids. Well, there's a major problem right there. There's a major problem. You see how this is a generational compounding problem? 
If you're like, I just, I don't even think I could teach my kids anything. That's a major problem. That will have generational effects if you don't. It's not only not knowing anything, but not passing it on will have the same generational effects. It's the same thing. My wife was gone for a few days. My wife was gone for a few days, so I reorganized the family a little bit, and it's the only way we made it through. It's basically because of my daughter. I basically, I elevated my daughter, and I told my daughter, I was like, you are now Jacob's mother for the next four days. And I, you know, I worked from home, you know, as much as I could, but she's over there, and she's like, just like, finish your homework, and do this, and do this, and then correct it, and I'm just like, I'm like, what in the world? But she has been led to be that way. And she's been led by her mother. She kept the house together. I mean, it, it, it was like a, it was, it, was, it was pretty good. We survived. And we wouldn't have if it wasn't for a leadership that had been passed on to her effectively. Okay, look, it is a major issue. Look, be a sacrificial leader, though. And guess what? When people know, when people in your family, when your children know, when children know that their mother will do anything for them, up to and including giving her life for them, when children know that their dad, you know, will sacrifice everything, his happiness, his joy, his finances, anything that it takes to make them succeed, you know, when people know that you will do anything, you will give anything of yours for their success, they will follow you anywhere. That goes for the secular workplace, that goes for your family, that goes for, for everything. Because it's, what it, because it's Jesus' philosophy. And Jesus would never tell us something that doesn't work. It does work. Just follow it. And then, guess what? You won't have problems, you know, imparting this influence on people that are following you. If you just follow this advice in Matthew chapter 23, basically all you have to do is read Matthew chapter 23, take notes, and do everything the opposite of what he's telling the Pharisees. And you will be an effective leader in your life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.